Hello and welcome to this Embedded Linux Conference 2021 talk. Um, we're going to talk about advanced uh, camera support for um, all winner SOCs using only mainline Linux. So, um, first of all, a, a few words about myself. So, I'm Paul Shakowski. I'm an embedded Linux engineer working at uh, Bootlean, where I do uh, some consulting as well as some training. So, um, I've been working especially on the Linux kernel in areas related to multimedia and graphics. And I've also created and I'm giving uh, sessions of the uh, displaying and rendering graphics with Linux training. So there are public sessions uh, available uh, if you're interested. Um, I live and work in the southwest of France in Toulouse where Bootlin has uh, one of its offices. So to begin this talk, uh, we're going to see some very common notions about uh, image capture technology. And uh, first, let's take a look at kind of a um, simplified image capture chain so that we can see the major um, elements that uh, are necessary for um, a, an image capture, a camera-based image capture chain. Uh, then we're going to see some of these aspects in more details. So first of all, we have the optics, uh, which are really in charge of uh, shaping the light and uh, converging the light uh, onto the sensor, which is the uh, electronic component uh, in charge of converting uh, the light that it receives uh, into some digital values that can then um, be transported to some complex, uh, more complex system, like a system on a chip. Um, and we have some uh, processing that can happen on the sensor or on the more complex system, like the system on a chip, uh, which is really in charge of uh, converting the raw information received from the sensor into, into an actual uh, picture that looks good and that makes sense uh, for us to see. So when we have this good looking picture, we can then um, send it to a display uh, to be seen in, in uh, real time. Uh, so something like a preview. Uh, or it can be encoded to something like a JPEG for a still image or into uh, some video codec like uh, VP8 or H.264 uh, to produce a video. So during this talk, we're not going to talk about the display and encoding parts so much, uh, but we're going to focus especially on the interface and the processing steps. So uh, let's take a closer look at the hardware interfaces that are used to carry the information from the sensor uh, to the system on a chip. So nowadays, it's quite uncommon to find analog interfaces, so they are mostly deprecated. And instead, we have uh, digital interfaces that are used. So we find two types of those digital interfaces, the parallel, uh, let's say, family of interfaces, um, and then the serial, um, serial interfaces. So typically, the parallel interfaces um, are kind of used for the old or low-end sensors, and the serial ones uh, are typically used with the more high-end sensors. Um, so if we take a look at a basic example for parallel, uh, the way that it works is that uh, we have typically one TTL signal uh, for each uh, data bit that needs to be transmitted. So we'll find like 8, 10, 12, 16, 24 uh, bits uh, bus width. And uh, we will find some signals aside of that, like uh, the pixel clock, which is the uh, frequency for the transmission of the, uh, the information and some synchronization signals as well, uh, H-Sync and V-Sync to synchronize the beginning of a new line and the beginning of a new frame. And if we take a look at a uh, serial interface, we have something quite different because in this case, we're using differential pairs as uh, very often uh, in my PySASI2, we use double data rates, uh, meaning that we have two samples per clock cycle. Uh, we will have one set of differential pair dedicated to the clock, so that's the clock lane, uh, which will typically run at pretty high rates, uh, again, because the uh, data is serialized. And then we will find a number of data lane uh, that can be between one and four, um, in which the, the data will be distributed and uh, gathered back uh, on the other side. So that's the, the difference between those, let's say, two main families of uh, digital uh, camera interfaces, so parallel and and serial, um, and so we're going to talk about MyPy CSI2 a little bit later uh, in the case of the all winner uh, platforms. So that was for the interfaces. Now let's talk a little bit about the processing step, uh, which I mentioned. So processing is necessary in the camera pipeline because the data that comes from the sensor directly, so it comes from an ADC that will sample some photo sites. Um, these are not directly pixel values that you get, but instead you only get one of red, green, or blue. Uh, values for each photo site. Uh, so this is called a bio pattern, uh, where you basically have color filters uh, in front of each photo site to only receive one of the colors. Uh, 
Uh, and so in order to create pixels, you need to do some interpolation to um, actually give one red, green, and blue value for each uh, pixel. And then, so that, that's one of the things that needs to be done in terms of processing, but there are lots of different things that need to be uh, compensated or, or corrected. So for example, the brightness uh, is um, captured in a linear way, but uh, in order to, for the, the, uh, the image to be displayed uh, on a typical display, uh, you need some adaptation with a gamma curve in order to uh, give more, uh, let's say, weight to the uh, information in the mid and high tones. Um, there, there are also some uh, things related to the sensors, uh, which is the dock level current. So typically the sensors will have a non-zero um, uh, value for the dock. So you need to kind of uh, deduce an offset to have uh, some blacks that actually look black. And then you will also get issues about noise. Uh, typically the noise will come from the amplification stages and uh, in an, electric, uh, in a, uh, an ana analog um, electronic system, you'll always get some, some residual noise. So this will actually show by um, uh, uh, um, creating some uh, bad uh, colors uh, on, the, uh, on the picture. So this is something that needs to be corrected. Uh, then the colors that are captured uh, are typically off and they won't really look realistic. So this needs to be corrected as well. So uh, in order to apply uh, these enhancements as well as other types of enhancements, um, the, uh, the dedicated components to do that are called the image signal processes. And so typically they can be uh, attached to the sensor. So they can be in the same package as the sensor or they can be separate. Uh, typically in the system on a chip, there can be an ISP uh, dedicated in there. And so basically the ISP, uh, which is in charge of applying all the enhancements that we need, uh, will be divided into three different domains. So we have the bio domain, which uh, is the first step that handles the raw data. Then we have some RGB domains. So after we have done the debiring step to get some actual pixels. Um, so we will then apply some enhancements there as well. And finally, we will convert the image into a YUV representation, uh, which is uh, a different color model uh, than RGB, which is really well adapted for video because it separates the luminance, uh, which is kind of like the luminosity, the brightness, uh, from the chrominance, which is the color information, uh, because typically we will apply some subsampling to the chrominance in order to reduce uh, the size of the image. So this is an illustration of uh, these three different steps. So you can see on the left side, the image with the bio pattern, um, which looks really uh, off and, and, and bad. And then the RGB step where we have applied some enhancements. So we have applied some white balance, denoising, uh, things like that to make the image look, spe look better. And then finally, we have the YUV color model decomposition on the right side. So this is a list of the typical enhancements uh, that we find in an ISP. Um, so I mentioned a few already, like the black level correction. Uh, we can also mention dead pixel correction when the photo sites are stuck into a specific value uh, which needs to be discarded. Uh, white balance is also quite important uh, in order to adjust the balance of the red, green, and blue channels to uh, have a correct balance between those and for the, the, the whites on the picture to actually look white. Uh, noise filtering I mentioned already. Uh, the color matrix is used to recreate uh, the kind of uh, uh, fidelity of the colors, uh, the gamma to adjust the brightness for the non-linearity of the displays, um, the saturation, which will increase the colorfulness of the image, then the general brightness to increase or decrease the luminosity. Uh, we can also play on the contrast to um, increase or decrease the difference between the dark and the bright areas of the image. So that's typically the base enhancements that we will find in an ISP. But we can also find some more advanced enhancements as well. Uh, for example, uh, the lens shading will correct the irregular brightness uh, that appears on lenses, where basically you have a bright spot at the center of the lens, and then on the edges you have more uh, darker uh, spots. Uh, so the lens shading correction step will basically uh, flatten this to have the same brightness um, uh, on all uh, areas of the, the, the lens. Uh, lens dewarp is used for um, let's say the, the fish eye or the, 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 the lenses that have very low focals uh, where basically the geometry will be distorted. So the DWAP will basically restore the correct geometry. Then you have um, stabilization, which is about cropping into the image to remove the shaking uh, that can happen if the camera is handheld, uh, if it's not very stable and so on. Then finally, another enhancement is the color lookup table, uh, which is basically a way to translate from the colors that you have into another set of colors, which will be slightly different uh, in order to give a specific style to the image. Uh, 
So for example, this is often called a filter. Uh, so you apply a filter to the image to give it a, a specific style. So like I was saying, uh, the hardware implementations of the ISPs that do all of these steps to improve the image and to make it look uh, reasonable and, and, and look like what we expect, uh, they can be implemented in the sensor, uh, in which case the data that is sent on the hardware uh, camera interface will directly be the YUV data, which is the final step of the processing. Uh, it's also possible that it only does some of the enhancements, but not all of them. So you will still, in that case, uh, get some buyer data that was slightly modified. Um, and uh, in the other case where you don't have an ISP or just a very simple ISP, then it's up to the system on a chip to have its own uh, ISP to apply the enhancement steps and get a good looking picture at the end. So in that case, the ISP on the system on a chip uh, we'll need to uh, have some calibration data uh, and some specific uh, configuration to be adapted to the sensor and to the lens uh, that are used because some of the steps uh, are quite specific to the two. So um, there are some parameters that need to be adjusted depending on the situation um, in order to create a good picture. So not all of the parameters can just be calibrated once and then used for the whole lifetime of the camera. So this is typically the case of the focus, uh, which will depend on the area of interest that we want to see sharp and clear. Uh, then there is the white balance, which will depend on the light source that is used. Uh, typically, you can have um, warm uh, light sources, which tend to be more orange-ish, or you can have cold sources, which tend to be more blue-ish. And so depending on the light that you use, um, you will need to apply different white balance uh, to get the white areas of the picture to actually look white instead of bluish or orange-ish. And then there is expo uh, exposition, exposure, which is the uh, um, kind of one of the very important steps to get a good uh, looking picture because it's about regulating the amount of light um, that will be captured by the sensor. Um, so this is typically um, depending on a number of parameters. Uh, the first one being the diaphragm that can be in front of the sensor, which will uh, open or close to uh, allow more or less light uh, to get in. Then there is the exposure time, which is the time uh, configured in the sensor for which the, uh, the photo sites are exposed to light. So if they are exposed for a short time, they will get less light than uh, if they are exposed for a long time. And then another uh, parameter, which is not directly about the light, uh, but more uh, on the second step, is the amplification gain that is applied on the sensor. So even if you get a small amount of light, you can still apply um, uh, electronic gain which will uh, increase the signal that is received, uh, but it will also increase the gain. So typically this is not a, a very good way to uh, get more information because you also get more noise uh, that way. So these parameters need to be set manually and people who are uh, photography enthusiasts know how to kind of tweak these different parameters to get um, the result that they want. Uh, there are also some um, artistic implications when changing these parameters. Uh, but in many cases, we basically want these parameters to be controlled automatically. And this is where the notion of 3A algorithms comes in. So these algorithms are basically about uh, controlling these parameters automatically and, um, and basically doing a, a good job at that. So having automatic exposition uh, in order to control the time, the exposure time, uh, perhaps also the diaphragm if it's available. Uh, you have the autofocus, uh, which will detect if the um, basically if the scene is sharp or not, and then it will adjust the focus lens uh, in order to, to get uh, the scene uh, sharp and in focus. And then the, you have the auto white balance, uh, like I was saying, depending on the light source, uh, that can be adjusted. And so uh, there are these 3A algorithms uh, to, to do that. So um, common algorithms are uh, described in the academic literature, so they are known, but the implementations, the actual implementations will depend on the specifics of the ISPs, um, especially because uh, these algorithms need to implement a, a closed loop or feedback loop system. So basically the ISP will gather, gather some statistics about the, the, the picture, about the frame, um, that it will use to deduce the correct parameters uh, that need to be applied for the exposition, the focus and the white balance. Uh, 
And so the way that the statistics and the parameters are defined uh, is usually specific to the hardware. And as a result, the algorithms are often uh, also uh, hardware specific and considered to be the secret sauce. So they are not often um, out in the open. And there are also no, uh, let's say, generic implementations uh, for the 3A. So keep in mind that this is typically something that is um, dependent on the hardware, uh, uh, which is the ISP and the sensor as well. OK, so that, that's it for kind of the, the general uh, notions about the technology. So uh, we talked about the digital interfaces and then the, the ISPs more specifically. Uh, which is the topic that I wanted to mention with the uh, all winner platforms. So before we get into that, let's kind of take a global look at uh, the status of um, all winner SOC support uh, with mainline Linux and especially regarding the components that relate to the, the camera uh, integration. So we basically have uh, three main types of uh, hardware blocks that are involved in the, in the camera pipeline. Uh, the first one is the central one, uh, it's called the CSI controller. And so it does a bunch of things, um, especially um, it, uh, it has a DMA engine to uh, write the pixels that it receives into the memory of the system. And it can receive uh, pixels from parallel interfaces. So it supports different types of parallel interfaces. Uh, so there's simple parallel with just TTL signals. Um, it also supports BT656 um, parallel interfaces, which are kind of a subtype. Uh, which are specific to some um, standards. And so this is the central controller that we uh, nearly always find in all winner SOCs, or at least we find it uh, whenever the platform supports uh, camera, uh, some, some camera interface. And there are basically three generations of this controller. Uh, the first one was found in the A10 and A20 and similar chips. So um, it has evolved uh, into a second generation that was found on uh, let's say a greater number of chips. Uh, it started with the A31, and uh, we also find it with, uh, in lots of um, other generations up to the A64. So um, the, the work that, that I've done around that was on the V3, so that was on the second generation on the, of the CSI controller. And for the newer platforms, the newer Arduino platforms, there was a third generation uh, of this controller, which is now called the CSIC. And uh, it goes from the A63 uh, up to the, basically the new, new platforms that Arduino is releasing, uh, releasing uh, recently. So this is the kind of the, the, the latest one that we know. And so in that third generation, uh, there was basically a whole re re redesign, sorry, uh, a redesign of the uh, camera uh, interface blocks uh, in Arduino SOCs. So it's kind of quite different from the second generation, even though you still find some similarities. Uh, there are also uh, some significant differences. So that's for the, um, just the CSI controller uh, and CSIC. Uh, then there is MyPy CSI2, uh, which is basically a, a separate dedicated controller that uh, is connected to the CSI controller. So it acts like a bridge. Uh, we find different hardware implementations of this one. Uh, there was one uh, specific implementation on the A80, one on the A83T, and those two are, are really one-off uh, one of a time kind of implementations that were not found on any platforms. Uh, and then we had a first generation of a common implementation, uh, which was found uh, first on the A31. Uh, it's also found on the V3, uh, probably also on the T7 chip. And then we find a second generation of common, uh, let's say, implementation, uh, which is uh, um, made as a combo with other interfaces like sub-LVDS and HiSpy, which are not, not all of them are always available, but uh, it's part of a, like a broader design of uh, interface bridges. And so we find that on the, um, the basically some of the devices from uh, the third generation of the CSI controllers. So we have the V5, V536, and V533. Um, and so, as you can see, the MyPy CSI2 controller is not always available um, in, in the old winner uh, chips. Just some of them have MyPy CSI2 support. So they are pretty much listed uh, in this slide. Uh, and then we have the third uh, important uh, part of the camera pipeline, which is the ISP processor. And so uh, this is the image signal processor implementation uh, from uh, old winner. Uh, there was a first generation that was tied uh, or glued to the CSI controller in the A10, N20, and uh, related. Then there was a second generation where it became a separate block uh, that would still uh, be connected to the CSI controller, but it had a different uh, register layout and uh, memory address, and etc. 
So it's found in the A31, A80, A83T, and V3. And we also find a trimmed down version on the A23, A3, and H5. Even though it's not advertised, uh, it's there in the hardware. Uh, but it doesn't support uh, uh, raw Bayer uh, processing. It only supports very minimal processing. So it's nearly useless, I would say, which is probably why Alwino doesn't uh, mention the, the fact that it's uh, available in, in those uh, SOCs as well. And then we have a third generation, uh, which kind of matches again the, th the third generation of CSI controller. Um, th in this case, the ISP was uh, also redesigned a little bit. It supports more features than the second generation. And so you find also um, other uh, naming. Uh, now it's called ISP 500, 520, and 521. And so you find those on the V5, V5, 3.6, and H616 uh, SOCs. So the thing we can remark is that uh, typically we get an ISP uh, in the hardware when there is MyPy CSI2 support. Uh, this is because typically MyPy CSI2 will be used with some sensors that send uh, raw Bayer data, in which case the ISP needs to be in the SOC. Uh, whereas for the parallel interface, it's quite common to have the ISP on the sensor. And so then you just receive YUV data and you don't need an ISP on the SOC side. So um, that's for the hardware related to the, the camera interface. Uh, if we take a look at the uh, general platform support for our winner, it's in pretty good shape. Uh, there's a very active community around it uh, called the Sangsi community. Uh, there's a wiki page about the current status of mainline. And basically what we can see is that the multimedia areas are basically the remaining ones um, that uh, are not uh, fully supported. So um, there's a, currently uh, a driver, driver available for the first generation CSI controller, so for the A10 and uh, A20 and related. And there's also a driver for the second generation, uh, Sun6i uh, CSI, so for the A31-based um, CSI controller. There is no support for the third generation, and uh, there was also no support for MyPy CSI2 and ISP support. So this is basically uh, what I've been working on. Uh, ISP support uh, was also in the Allwinner SDK and on free blob, so it was quite difficult to get started uh, in that area. So let's talk a bit now about the uh, general status of the V4L2 framework, which is really the, the Linux kernel subsystem dedicated to uh, media support. Uh, basically, it supports uh, everything that relates to pixels, which is not a display controller nor a GPU, uh, which are supported in DRM. Uh, so B4L2 will typically expose uh, video devices to user space, uh, which provide a uh, generic and coherent API uh, to do all the things uh, related to um, uh, image capture. So the typical steps will be format negotiation to configure the format uh, of the pixels that will be received, uh, to do the memory management, to allocate the buffers, um, to map them into the virtual memory of the system for user space to access them. Uh, and then we have a queue interface where we can um, basically submit the buffers to the driver. Then they will be filled by the hardware, by the DMA engines. And then user space can get the buffers back uh, with the pixels inside. So this approach works well, uh, but it works pretty much um, for all-in-one devices where um, you, you have a DMA uh, interface available in the same, uh, in the same device. Uh, but we're going to see that uh, there are some uh, limitations for more complex cases. Um, typically, when we have a chain of multiple blocks, uh, like the bridges um, that, that we might have, so when we have multiple components um, that each uh, can have their own configuration, um, for example, the sensor would be one of these blocks, the MyPy CSI2 bridge would be one, the CSI controller would be one, and so we have these different blocks that we can sometime, uh, sometimes connect in different ways. So we can configure the topology as well as configuring each block. And so in order to support this, the notion of V4L2 device uh, was not sufficient. And so a new uh, notion was introduced into V4L2, which is the notion of sub-devs. So the sub-devs represent just a single, uh, single block, uh, which is typically not DMA capable. Um, it will still be exposed to user space uh, through uh, sub-dev nodes. Uh, they will have their own uh, format configuration, their own uh, stream management. And basically, uh, the goal is that the video devices, which are the DMA interfaces into memory, uh, will call into the subdevs uh, to uh, typically start the stream or stop the streams and uh, to get the whole pipeline going uh, to finally receive the pixels into memory. <laughs> 
So in order for this to work, uh, the sub devs need to be gathered into a parent um, structure, into a parent device, uh, which is the V4L2 device, uh, not to be confused with the video device. So the v V4L2 device is really the controlling entity that will group the video device and the sub devs, typically. So um, if the hardware is, uh, let's say, relatively simple and you just have uh, one hardware entity uh, that might have some uh, sub entities, then you can have a single driver which will register a V4L2 device, uh, then it will have a, a video device for the um, uh, DMA interface part, and then it might have some sub devs if there are parts internally that can be configured uh, and where the topology can be changed. Uh, but in more complex cases, you might have multiple drivers involved. Uh, typically, when you have a sensor, uh, the sensor has its own driver which registers a sub dev, and then you will have uh, a DMA interface driver which will be distinct and separate. And so in this case, um, you will need to have some link between these two drivers. Uh, so the way that it works is that uh, the driver with the video device uh, will register the V4L2 device, and then the, um, the driver for the sub dev will register the sub dev uh, as asynchronously. Uh, so basically it makes it available for another driver to bind and, and use it. So uh, then we need a step for that driver to identify uh, the sub dev and to claim that sub dev uh, in the V4L2 uh, API. So the way that it works uh, to do that is that there is a, a representation of the connection between these blocks through the FW node graph. So typically this will use the device tree port and endpoint representation um, where uh, you will be able to create these links between the different uh, devices. So the, the, the main driver will um, basically get a reference to the endpoint uh, using the FW node graph get endpoint by ID. Uh, then it can pass the endpoint uh, because this endpoint will actually also contain some information about the bus if that's applicable. So for example, for a sensor device, uh, you will get some information about the, um, the, hardware, the camera hardware interface bus that is used to connect this sensor to the SOC. So for example here, I've put the, um, the type and the structure for my PI CSI2 uh, used with a DeFi. So you will be able to get some information like the number of lanes uh, that need to be used or the clock frequency that needs to be used uh, with the, the sensor. So this is a, a, an illustration of the uh, device tree that we have to connect the sensor to the MyPi CSI2 bridge. So you can see the port and endpoint representation with the properties describing the specifics of the bus. So now that the, the, um, the, the top driver or the, the main driver was able to identify the sub devs uh, using the FW node graph, it will basically need to wait for that driver to be available. So this happens with the V4L2 async notifier. So uh, basically the driver will create a notifier. Uh, it will register the FW node handle that it got from the device tree representation with the port and endpoints. And then it will register the notifier with a callback. And when the driver becomes available, so when the sub dev uh, becomes registered asynchronously, then this driver will get a callback and it will know that the sub dev has become available. And then uh, the sub dev will be attached to the uh, V4L2 device uh, registered by that driver. So this is how uh, the, the link between the two uh, actually happens. So that's for the V4L2 subdev part. So now we have, we have a way to, to have multiple subdevs um, that can be connected to a, a, a video device driver. And by the way, a subdev can also depend on other subdevs uh, using the same mechanism. So you can create complex chains like that with multiple subdevs that will call into each other. Uh, but this doesn't uh, allow us to uh, represent the topology of, the, of these devices. And so for that, we have an, an extra API called the Media Controller API, um, where we will basically describe all of the elements that are involved in the, in the uh, media graph, uh, in the media pipeline. So basic, basically, these blocks can be, um, um, they are called entities. Uh, so they can be video devices or subdevs. And each entity will have some pads, uh, which represent the uh, connection points between those uh, entities. So there can be sync uh, pads um, that will receive some data or source pads that will provide some data. Uh, each entity has a function. It has a particular function that is declared. And um, we will find links between the uh, pads of these entities. Uh, so then basically we have a complete representation of the different paths that can exist between uh, those different entities. Uh, 
So when multiple paths exist, uh, all of the links will be registered by the driver and then uh, user space will be able to select which link uh, can be enabled or, uh, or needs to be enabled or disabled so that it's possible to change the actual topology, so to change the actual data flow uh, between the, the entities. So we have this media CTL command line tool uh, that can be used to enable or disable links. Uh, it can also be used to visualize the, the topology of the different entities uh, that interact together. Another important thing is that when we start streaming, when we actually start streaming some data, um, there will be some runtime validation that is performed by the media controller subsystem. Um, it will basically check, check that on all the enabled links, uh, the source and the sync uh, have a valid connection. So for example, uh, if the two entities uh, have some configuration, uh, you need to make sure typically that uh, dimensions will be the same, that the formats will be the same and so on, so that it makes sense to connect uh, the sync and the source of these different entities. So this is now an illustration of the IMX capture driver, which is uh, quite a complex one. So you can see in green, you have all of the um, uh, V4L2 subdevs. So you can have some sensors at the top and some uh, bridges or processing blocks uh, uh, in the middle. And then in yellow, we find the video devices, which represent the DMA and faces uh, where we'll actually get uh, the data. So now that we can see how to support uh, complex pipelines with multiple devices, thanks to the subdevs, uh, FW not graph, asynchronous reg registration, and uh, media controller API, uh, let's talk about the ISPs more, specific, more specifically. So um, the, uh, the ISPs typically have very specific parameters for their internal blocks, uh, which are not uh, represented through the, uh, uh, the media graph or with subdevs because they are uh, way too specific. Um, so typically, uh, we will have one subdev, one core subdev that represents the processor of the ISP. And then uh, we will find capture devices uh, for the outputs. So um, there can be one or multiple capture interfaces depending on the hardware. Uh, but then we will also find video interfaces which are not uh, for capture, uh, but uh, which will be for providing the parameters for the configuration of the ISP. So you also get a video device with a queue, but in this case, the, what you provide to the queue is not a pixel buffer that was allocated, but it will be a structure of data. So the type of the queue will be different. Uh, it will be um, a meta output uh, queue for uh, the parameters, and you get something quite similar for the statistics that is provided by the ISP, especially to do the 3A algorithms. So in this case, we have a meta capture uh, queue, where we will get a specific type of uh, data structures that represents um, the statistics that were gathered by the ISP. So typically, uh, with those different video devices, we are able to represent uh, the specific parameters of the ISP, the specific uh, statistics of the ISP, and then we have uh, uh, the capture and faces, and a subdev in the middle, which kind of uh, coordinates everything. So if we take a look at one such ISP driver, which is the RK ISP1 driver, uh, which is a really good example if you want to understand how the ISP topology works. Um, you can find a subdev uh, for the sensor, then a subdev for the, um, the ISP itself, which coordinates. Uh, and then you have in, in uh, yellow the video interfaces. So you have one for the parameters, one for the statistics, and then you have two for the, uh, the, capture, uh, the, the capture video devices. So uh, now let's kind of uh, talk about the specific work that uh, I have done for uh, advanced camera support on Arduino. So we can see that basically all of the basic uh, pieces that we need to support it are available in V4L2. So uh, what was left was to actually uh, add support for the relevant components. So the scope of this task uh, was first to add support for some specific sensors that we were going to use, uh, which use MyPy CSI2. So um, on my side, I worked on the OV5648 uh, with MyPy CSI2 on the Allwinner V3S. So this required adding support for the MyPy CSI2 controller of the A31, uh, which is the one that the V3 uh, SOC is using. Uh, in parallel, we had a, an internship uh, in the summer of 2020 uh, where uh, Kevin Arlington worked on a different sensor uh, with a different platform. So that was the A83T. Uh, which had a different MyPy CSI2 controller, so we kind of worked on the two in parallel. And then in a second phase, I added basic support for the, uh, the ISP 
Uh, so the second generation ISP uh, with basic features uh, like debuyering, so converting uh, from the buyer representation into RGB and into uh, YUV with some specific gain and offset for the red, green, and blue uh, components. And I also added support for the 2D noise reduction. So this is the Banana Pi M3, which is the board that was used for the A83T part of the work, uh, which our intern Kevin uh, has worked with. So let's talk about supporting the sensors. So we had two new sensors that were not supported by the Linux kernel and adding support for them was actually quite significant work um, because we had some reference code, but it was using lots of uh, large arrays of register and values, which were just provided as uh, hex numbers with no documentation and no details. Uh, so we had to look for the documentation in, in the actual literature of the manufacturer and, and write a clean and proper driver um, that would correctly define the registers instead of just putting values. Um, we also wanted to uh, make some clear code and so to avoid these large arrays of pre-configured registers but instead have some proper functions to configure the registers um, for each part of the sensor. And uh, one of the aspects was also to uh, find out and document the clock tree uh, which is used to derive the specific timings that are used for the different dimensions and frame rates uh, that will be used for the sensors. So this resulted in, in big structures, lots of definitions to create some uh, clean drivers, but sometimes for s a small number of registers, we didn't have the documentation even in the literature of the manufacturer, so uh, we still had to have some uh, fixed arrays, uh, but they were really minimal, and we basically reduced that to the minimum. So here you can see um, the, the structures that were defined uh, for the modes on the right side. So you can see the different elements that need to be configured and especially the configuration for the PLLs, uh, which define the, um, the different clocks that will be used internally uh, to uh, support the, uh, the mode that we want. So the dimension and the frame rate that we want uh, for our sensors. So we supported multiple modes for each of the sensors. So this work was sent out first in October 2020. Uh, there were a number of uh, iterations and eventually it was accepted in December 2020. So you can see that each driver is between two and three thousands of lines. So these are pretty big drivers uh, to support these sensors. So now let's talk about uh, MyPy CSI2 support, which was developed in parallel uh, uh, of the sensor drivers. So um, again, like I was saying a bit earlier, the MyPy CSI2 controllers will actually feed the data that they receive into the CSI controller. Uh, so they are uh, basically uh, represented in V4L2 as subdevs of the CSI controller. And then we have the sensors, which are subdevs of the, the MyPy CSI2 bridges. So to support all of that, we needed to add some adaptation to the CSI code to properly select this MyPy CSI2 interface instead of the parallel interface. Uh, then these drivers also need to retrieve the pixel rate from the sensor uh, in order to correctly configure the, the, the clocks, uh, especially the DeFi block, which handles the physical layer of MyPy CSI2. Uh, it was integrated using the generic Linux Phi API, which supports uh, the MyPy DeFi, uh, but the helpers didn't actually account for DDL, so we had to add a, a factor of two uh, at some point in the code. So to actually add support for the hardware, uh, we could use some reference source code uh, from Alwiner for the A83T, uh, which has a number of magic values which we couldn't really figure out because there was just no documentation around. So we kind of imported some of those magic values into our uh, mainline drivers. In the case of the A83T, the DeFi code is mixed with the controller code. So the registers are uh, very, uh, they are in the same layout. Um, but in the implementation, we still separated the two and we created still a Phi uh, provider and consumer uh, within the same driver. So for the A31 um, um, generation MyPy CSI2 bridge, which we implemented on the V3, V3S, uh, there was some reference source code uh, in the Alwina SDK, which wasn't so bad. Uh, we also found some documentation in the A31 user manual about this controller, so this was quite helpful. Uh, for the D5, uh, in this case, it's separate from the controller. Uh, it was the same that was used for MyPy DSI, uh, which was already supported in the Linux kernel. Uh, the difference was that we needed to use this D5 in uh, receive mode instead of transmit mode. Uh, so we added support for receive mode, but then we needed a way to, um, um, to select or to uh, distinguish uh, to know uh, whether the file was going to be used in Rx or Tx. Uh, 
So at first I came up with a uh, sub mode, which is something from the Phi API that allows to select a sub mode for the Phi. Uh, but this wasn't really appropriate because it's not a runtime decision. Uh, the block will be dedicated to uh, CSI2 or DSI, so it will either be received or transmit, but it won't be something that you can switch at runtime, at run uh, which is what the sub mode uh, is really about. So then I considered using a different device tree compatible to represent that, but this is not really a good fit uh, either because it's still the same hardware block. It's just the way that it's used, uh, which is different. So a different compatible wasn't really justified. So in the end, I used the device tree property, uh, which is optional to indicate uh, the direction of the transfer that the file was going to be used in. So then when you configure the file, depending on the mode, it will configure the receive or transmit part uh, accordingly. So uh, for this work, for the MyPy CSI2 bridges, the first uh, iteration was sent out in October 2020, and it was later uh, integrated into the uh, ISP series, the, the bigger series uh, adding support for the ISP. So let's talk about this one now, uh, starting with a few um, elements about the, the ISP itself. So uh, the ISP will receive the data from the CSI controller. Um, it also has an input for direct uh, DRAM, so direct DMA, uh, but it's very likely broken. Uh, it's described in the registers, but it's, m it's not really functional, or at least no one was able to make it work, uh, including all winner. So we can consider that it just directly takes uh, uh, the, the data from the CSI controller. So this requires uh, also some work on the CSI controller itself. Um, to separate the bridge from the DMA engine uh, on the CSI controller because when we use the ISP, we no longer want to use uh, the DMA controller of the CSI controller. Um, we just want to configure some parts of it, but not the parts related to actually writing to memory, which will be done by the ISP. Um, there is actually an internal MUX uh, to inside the CSI controller to uh, direct the data flow to the ISP or to the CSI DMA engine. And we found that when uh, you start using the ISP and the switch uh, becomes switched to the ISP path, um, then you cannot switch it back to the CSI DMA controller without a reboot, uh, which is kind of problematic. And uh, this is something that we will probably need to address at some point in the code uh, to print an error or something like that. Um, so another aspect is that there are two outputs available for, for the hardware. Uh, we only added support for one, the, the main channel. And so like I was saying, uh, adding support for the ISP required some rework of the CSI. So to separate the DMA engine from uh, the, the, let's say the more common logic uh, that we need to keep. But there was also the difficulty of um, attaching the CSI controller to the V4L2 and media devices registered by the ISP driver when the ISP uh, is available. But when the ISP is not available, we still wanted the CSI controller to register its own V4L2 and media devices. So there are basically two code paths that are uh, a little bit different to uh, handle these two different uh, situations. And we have a helper uh, designed to detect if the ISP is available or not. So this is the media topology that we have for a driver. Uh, here you can see we have a sensor, we have a MyPy CSI2 bridge, then we have the CSI bridge, which can, which can have its own capture interface uh, or uh, which can be connected to the ISP. Uh, so the ISP gets a video node uh, for the parameters uh, and it gets a video node for the capture so where the final pixels uh, will be received. Uh, one thing when, we, uh, when I added support for this driver uh, is that I found out that it has a, quite an unusual synchronization mechanism. So only a very small number of drivers can actually be accessed directly with uh, memory mapped I.O. But for the other registers which concern most of the modules of the ISP, uh, you need to write the register information into a buffer. Uh, then you provide the address of that buffer into the first registers that can be accessed. And then um, at the next um, vertical sync, when a flag is set, the ISP uh, will go and read this uh, load buffer and it will copy its content uh, into its actual registers and uh, it will use those values to process the frame that it receives. So this is basically a synchronization mechanism uh, that works by uh, writing the next register, so the registers for the next frame, into uh, a buffer in DRAM. And uh, it, this gets copied uh, by the hardware itself. And it will also copy the old contents of the registers uh, into a safe buffer, uh, which is also allocated uh, in, in memory. <laughs> 
So like I was saying, we have a uh, specific video device to receive the parameters of the ISP. So it has an, um, an attached UAPI structures, structure, um, Sun 6i ISP params config, which basically has the parameters for some of the modules, uh, for the ones that we support. And like I was saying earlier, currently we support uh, debiring with some coefficients uh, and we support 2D noise filtering in that driver. Uh, but there are many, many more modules uh, with enhancement steps uh, that exist in the hardware. And as a result, uh, the API, especially the parameters API, uh, is incomplete. Uh, it doesn't support all of the modules. So as a result, this, uh, this UAPI cannot be made uh, a stable UAPI that is public in the kernel. So this is why the UAPI and the driver was submitted uh, to staging. And so then they can be removed once all of the features are supported. So the patch series for this was sent out in September 2021. Uh, you can see it's about um, well eight or nine thousand, uh, eight to nine thousand uh, insertions. So it's it's quite a, a very quite a big work. Uh, lots of uh, code that was written and modified for this. Uh, there was basically a major redesign of the the CSI driver. So now that this was submitted, uh, it's still under review and there will be more uh, iterations before it's, uh, it make, makes its final way into uh, Linux. Uh, let's take a look at the future steps um, for this driver. So we could add support for more platforms, uh, especially the A83T, uh, which should be very, very similar to the V3 um, uh, implementation. Um, we should still have some hardware revisions that are exposed and there is a way to do that. Uh, with a media device uh, because uh, even in the same generation of ISPs there are some modules that are not available in some specific platforms so we should account for that with a hardware re revision. Uh, then we should also add support for the statistics uh, for the three A algorithms. Uh, we can also add support for the second channel for the output but also support scaling and rotation which are available. Um, of course completing the UAPI with the description of the parameters for all of the modules uh, would be really great and it would allow stabilizing the UAPI and of course adding support for uh, all of the modules in the driver itself would be great. It would add some um, extra enhancement steps um, to make the uh, received image uh, look good and, um, and yeah, be what we expect the image to be. And then uh, when, the, when some of these modules are available, we'll be able to develop uh, 3A algorithm support. Uh, to do the uh, automatic uh, white balance, uh, focus, and uh, exposition. Uh, and by the way, this is uh, something that should be implemented in user space. And there is a community-driven project uh, specifically to gather the, um, the implementations for that. So this is Leap Camera. Uh, it provides uh, abstractions for the applications that want to use these complex types of pipelines. So it will handle both the uh, complexity of the pipeline as well as the hardware-specific 3A algorithms implementations. So we will need to add one for the Arduino A31 ISP. And it's definitely a very good fit. Uh, this is what Leap Camera is there to support. So it would be really nice to, to add support for that. So if you're interested uh, in using this ISP and if you uh, would like to see this work continue uh, in the steps that I've just described. Uh, if you'd be interested in Leap Camera support, uh, of course, feel free to contact us and we'll be uh, happy to start a discussion to see how we can tackle all of these different uh, points. And uh, to conclude, just a final note about the hardware availability. So it, it's not very common to find all winner boards, uh, especially with the drivers that I've been working on. So with the, the V3 ISP and the A31 MyPy CSI2 support. Uh, but there is the S3 Olinux Sino that was announced by Olimex, uh, which has a Raspberry Pi compatible MyPy C sorry, CSI2 connector. So you can see the board here. Um, and uh, yeah, it will soon be available and it will typically be uh, able to leverage all the work uh, that I've presented uh, to you today. So yeah, that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have questions or things that you would like to discuss about this, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, again, uh, we are definitely interested in, in continuing this work. So if you have interest in that, uh, let's get in touch and, and continue the discussion. So thank you.